This is From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in an encouraging series this month called Beauty for Ashes, The Story of Ruth. In today's message, we'll explore the life choices that we often make and the consequences those choices have on our faith and our relationship with the Lord in a revealing lesson entitled, Are You Blaming God? starting a new series today on the book of Ruth. I've entitled this series, Beauty for Ashes, a verse from Isaiah chapter 61, where the Lord says he gives beauty for ashes, and God really does do that. You know, the book of Ruth is an interesting little book just right there in the Old Testament. Joshua judges Ruth. Sandwiched in between Judges and 1 Samuel is this little four-chapter book, the book of Ruth, that focuses in on one specific family that lived in Bethlehem. It's a book that has heartache and heartbreak and tragedy and loss. That's how it begins, on such a sad note, but it ends on such a happy note. It starts with ashes, but it ends with beauty because God is the God who gives beauty for ashes. I believe that the Lord has many, many things he wants to speak to our hearts about so that we would look to him even in the midst of suffering and pain and trust him and see God do great and mighty things. I believe that God has a word that he wants to speak to you today. So if you have your Bible, please turn to Ruth chapter 1. And let's look at the story of Elimelech and Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Ruth chapter 1 says this, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed. You might want to make a note in your Bible. The days when the judges governed, that was between 1350 B.C. and 1050 B.C. Those were the days, that 300-year period. Those were the days of the judges. The first judge was Joshua, uh, Caleb's nephew. His name was Othniel. The last judge was Samuel. And after Samuel, the people asked for a king, and the days of the judges were over. But it says that it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn literally to live for a little while in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech. That name means my God is king. And the name of his wife, Naomi, her name means pleasantness. And it's a beautiful story. My God is king married pleasantness, and they have two sons. The name of the two sons, the first one was Malon, And the other was Kilion, kind of an interesting name, Malon and Kilion. Malon means sickly. Kilion means wasting away. Some of you that are pregnant and you're wondering about names, uh, we would be excited to do your baby dedication. This is sickly and this is wasting away. Uh, But obviously they had some issues at birth. Uh, That's what they named their kids. But it says they were Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now, they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilion also died, and the women were bereft, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. And when she came back to Bethlehem, the Scripture says in verse 19, 
So she and Ruth, they went, both went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came about when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Is this pleasantness? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me pleasantness since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought harm to me. Here's our question to consider today. Very personal question. Are you blaming God for the bad circumstances in your life? I want you to notice with me three insights from Ruth chapter 1. Insight number one, your choices have a lot to do with your circumstances. Your choices have a lot to do with your circumstances. Now, Ruth or, or Naomi is obviously blaming God for her sorry lot in life. But she is not thinking anything about the choices she has made. Now, sometimes we have things come into our lives, bad things come into our lives, have absolutely nothing to do with the choices that we made. And then there are other times that bad things come into our lives, and they have a lot to do with the choices that we have made. Now, in our story, Elimelech, my God is king, and Naomi, pleasantness, they make the choice as a family to move from Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the place of our Lord's birth. Bethlehem, the city of David. It was going to be called the city of David. It wasn't, David wasn't born yet. But Bethlehem is a special place in God's heart. Bethlehem literally means house of bread. And how ironic. There is a famine in the house of bread. So Elimelech and Naomi make the decision to go to Moab, about 50, 60 miles away to the east, on the other side of the Dead Sea. That is a terrible decision. God says of this place called Moab, he talks about it twice in the book of Psalms. He says, Moab is my wash bowl. Moab is the place, poetically speaking, where God washes the dirt off his feet. Moab is God's garbage can. And so Elimelech and Naomi make the choice to move from Bethlehem, the house of bread, where it's tough right now in the house of bread because there's a famine, and they make the choice to go to Moab, God's garbage can. Not a good choice, but it's the choice that they made. Hey, your choices have a lot to do with your circumstances. Now, God is a good God, and he gives us the freedom to make choices. God doesn't make anybody a robot. You have the freedom to make choices. I have the freedom to make choices. Adam and Eve, in a perfect place, were given a choice. Of all the trees that God made, you may freely eat, but there was one tree. Don't eat of that tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, in the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. They had a choice. And God sets all of us up with a choice. He doesn't make anybody a robot. And we like choices. God gives us the freedom to choose. And that's a wonderful thing. But notice this. Every choice, every substantial choice you make in life has unchosen consequences associated with it. See, you are free to choose, I am free to choose, but I'm not free to choose, and you're not free to choose the consequences of your choice. I can make a choice today to say, you know, this afternoon after church, I'm going to drive down to downtown Texarkana, and I'm going to get myself on a tall building not a lot of them down there, but there are some get myself on a tall building, and I'm going to jump off the building. Jump off the roof of the building. I can choose to do that. What I can't choose is to say this. And on my way down, I'm going to do a couple of gainers and, uh, you know, twirl around a little bit like the guys off the board in the, in the Olympics, the, di the high dive, you know. I'm going to do all that. I'm going to land on my feet, and I'm going to walk to my car, and I'm going to go home and say, man, I marked that off the bucket list. But it doesn't work that way. I can choose to 
walk off the roof of a tall building in Texarkana, but I can't choose anything from that point. Every choice that you make has unchosen uh, consequences associated with it. Ruth and, uh, or I'm sorry, Naomi and Elimelech, they made the choice to move from Bethlehem to God's garbage can to this place called Moab, and it was a terrible choice. It was similar to the choice Lot made in Genesis chapter 13 when he made the choice to pitch his tent towards Sodom. That was a bad, bad choice that had terrible consequences associated with it. Here's another bad choice that had bad consequences associated with it. And here's the, here's the irony. Elimelech and Naomi, they're trying to escape the famine, and they go to Moab and run into three funerals. They're trying to escape what they perceived of was going to be death there in the famine-plagued land of Bethlehem, and they ran into death in Moab. They had bad things happen to them in Moab. Hey, you know what? Bad things happen in Moab because Moab is God's garbage can. You're not going to experience the blessings of God when you leave Bethlehem, when you leave the land of promise, when you leave that place to go to God's garbage can. And they no doubt, had bad circumstances. She went out full with Elimelech and sickly and wasting away. They went out to Moab. She came back empty. She came back without her husband and her two sons. You can't choose your consequences. Your choices have a lot to do with your circumstances. Secondly, your response to trials speaks volumes about your faith. It speaks volumes about your faith. Now, let's be honest here. Naomi didn't handle this very well. She comes back blaming God, angry with God, bitter at God. I love what Pam Tebow told me, Tim Tebow's mother with the things that have happened in Tim's life, with the way that the media was scrutinizing Tim and going after Tim and, and uh, kind of souring uh, every team on Tim. Pam said this in light of all those difficulties. She said, in our house, we don't do bitter. We don't do bitter. We refuse to get bitter. Why? Because bitterness is a poison. But Naomi had let the poison come in. Scripture says in Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one falls short of the glory of, of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Bitterness will sour your heart toward God. It'll sour your heart toward other people. It'll sour your heart toward life. And Naomi didn't do very well. Job did great, even though he was hurting. Job's not a machine. He was hurting. When his friends finally came to Job, and they saw him scraping himself. They sat with him for seven days and no one said a word because the scripture says they saw that his pain was very great. He's a human being and he's hurting. Naomi's a human being too, but she's not doing as well as Job. And you know what? You know, we, we look at Job and we say, man, I mean, what an example. But sometimes you look at Job and you just think, how, do you, how does that guy do that? I can't do that. I don't measure up to Job. So I'm glad Naomi's in the Bible. I'm glad this story's in the Bible because it's like, hey, Naomi, I, I can measure up to her. I mean, you know, she didn't do very well. And sometimes it helps us to have somebody that didn't do very well and God still loved them and God still worked in their lives because it gives hope to me when I'm struggling with being resentful and bitter and angry at God for things that come into my life. Now, here's something that Naomi had that is so wonderful. She had honesty, honesty. She really shared what was going on in her heart. And maybe you're here today and you know what? You're going through a situation. You can relate to Naomi. Maybe you've lost a loved one or maybe you're dealing with a terminal illness in yourself or in a family member. 
Maybe you're experiencing the death of your dream, or maybe as we prayed earlier, you're very, very fearful about the future, and things have happened to kind of cripple your future, and you're struggling with being angry about it. You got to get honest. She was honest. God can work in an honest heart. He can't work in a dishonest heart. Here's the thing about Naomi. She teaches us that it's okay to hurt. When the difficulties come, it's okay to hurt. She's human. You're human. When you go through hard times, it's okay to hurt. But what's not okay is to cover up. It's not okay when people ask you, close friends ask you, it's not okay to act like it's no big deal. It is a big deal. You know it, and God knows it, and you need to get honest about it. I had a lady tell me one time that she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she had to have serious surgery. And, you know, when you get a diagnosis of breast cancer, it's not like saying, hey, you, you got to get your hip replaced. I mean, this is major, major, major. You could die. And she told her older son what was going on and that mom's got breast cancer and mom has to have surgery. And he, his eyes began to well up with tears, and he took his fingers and stuck them right in the corners of his eyes so he wouldn't cry. Because so he could hold back the tears. It's okay to cry. It's okay to hurt. And it's okay to struggle. I had a dear, dear lady message me just the other day, and she lost her husband, and she loved him dearly. And this was some months ago, and she just said to me, she said, I'm just struggling. It's okay to struggle. It's okay, because you're human, and God knows. And you know, some people may be more like Job, and they're able to handle it better. And maybe you're saying, but I'm not able to handle this very well. It's okay to hurt, and it's okay to struggle. Let me tell you something you need to do when you struggle, and this is something we learned from Naomi. You do not struggle in Moab. You get yourself to Bethlehem. She didn't say in Moab and just say, well, life stinks and I'm just going to uh, really struggle here. No, she said, I, I got to get back to the promised land. I got to get back to Bethlehem. And good things happen in Bethlehem. Nothing good happens in Moab. And see, you might be here today and you are, when you're honest, you say, I am bitter toward God and I'm angry at God and I'm blaming God saying, God, you didn't do right. And you're really struggling. Get yourself to Bethlehem. Come into the presence of the Lord. Come with God's people and sing his praises and be around where the Spirit of God is thick in the place because God can do miracles in your heart in Bethlehem. He can't do anything in Moab. It's okay to hurt and it's okay to struggle. And it's critical to press into the Lord and trust him. You can't just stay in this place of woundedness. You can't just live in this place of struggling. I pass through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't live there. I don't set up shop there in the valley of the shadow of death. I am going through it to the other side. Ruth is such a wonderful example of a pagan girl in Moab. You know what they worshiped in Moab? You know why Moab is such a bad place? God says in his word, Deuteronomy chapter 23, that no Ammonite or Moabite shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. Moab is God's garbage can. It's God's wash bowl. The Moabites were a thorn in the side of God's people. They were the enemies of God's people. Moab, the father, came from an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. That's how the Moabites came into being. They were a, a evil, wicked people. Their god was Chemosh, C-H-E-M-O-S, pronounced Chemosh. And that was the god of the Moabites. And the way you worshipped Chemosh was you sacrificed your sons and your daughters in the fire. That was the kind of people and, and the culture and the climate, climate of Moab. But there's a girl that comes out of Moab, Malon, or Kilion's wife, Malon's wife, and uh, her name's Ruth. 
She's different from her other sister-in-law, Orpah, because or- Orpah was going with Naomi back to Bethlehem, and then Naomi said, you need, to, you need to go back. Go back to your people. Go back to your gods. Gosh, why would you want to go back to that God? But Orpah kissed Naomi and then went back. But Ruth said no. She wouldn't. She was determined. And it says in verse 15, Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, Yahweh, shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me. And worse, if anything but death parts me from you, In verse 18, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. That's Ruth's statement of faith. She was determined to go with Naomi to leave behind the false gods of Moab and embrace the true God, Yahweh. It's almost like she was singing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. She had faith in the Lord, and she was going to press in to Jesus. It's critical to do that. Job, his great statement of faith, Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Though all these terrible things happen to me that I don't understand, God, though my heart is shattered in a million pieces, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Listen, there are three things that you can do when trials come. Three things. Number one, you can choose to endure it. Oh, the trial comes, the difficulty comes, and I'm just going to grit my teeth. I'm just going to get through this somehow, some way. I'm just going to endure it. That's not a good plan. When you try and endure your trials, your trials become your master, and you can easily get bitter in life and get bitter with God. The second thing you can do with trials, you can try and escape them. That's what, that's what uh, Elimelech and Naomi did. Hey, there's, there's a trial here. There's no food in Bethlehem in the house of bread. Let's go to God's garbage can. Let's go to Moab, and we'll escape the difficulty. We'll escape death. And by escaping death, they ran into death. Three funerals. You know, if you try and escape your problems and the trials that come in, you just, you just end up compounding your problems and your trials. See, every trial, God's trying to teach you something. He's trying to teach me something when the trials come. So it's so much better to say, Lord, I'm not going to try and escape this with drugs, with alcohol, with a, uh, leaving my family to go find another family. I'm not going to try and escape these things. I'm going to say, God, teach me what you want to teach me. Help me to learn and help me to grow. So you don't endure it. You don't escape it. What you do is enlist it. Enlist it and say, God, I'm going to let this trial be my servant, not my master, but my servant, and Lord, use it to teach me what you want me to know. Use it to help me not to get burned, but to get purified in the fire. Use it to scoop out all the dross As it says in Scripture, when he has tried me, Job said this, when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. Hey, you have a choice and I have a choice when we're facing the devastating issues of life. We can get bitter. We can blame God. We can follow in the footsteps of Ruth and trust the Lord no matter what. My friend, God wants to give you beauty for ashes too, just like he did Ruth. And it all begins when you open your heart to Jesus. Listen, if you're watching today and you're not sure that you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, today is the day for you. Just simply pray this prayer from your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again from the dead. And Lord, right now, I give my heart and my life to you. Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior, be real to me. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. 
I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on the screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's message, Are You Blaming God?, is available in multiple formats when you contact us today. It's also one of five in Pastor Jeff Shreve's inspiring and practical series entitled Beauty for Ashes, The Story of Ruth. Has life been difficult for you? Have fiery trials left you with ashes? Difficulties come to every life, but God gives beauty for ashes so that He will be glorified. In this verse-by-verse study of the book of Ruth, Dr. Jeff Shreve shares biblical truth to help you see God work and learn to trust Him more, even in the midst of heartache and heartbreak. It's available on USB, MP3 download, CD, or DVD this month for your gift of any amount to From His Heart. And with that gift, we'll also say thanks by sending you Pastor Jeff's timely booklet, Unveiling the Mystery of Prayer. Request yours when you make your gift by calling 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Your support allows us to be here and around the world each week. So thank you for investing in kingdom work through From His Heart. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org.